before the preaching of God's word. If you're able, please stand and let's pray again. Father God, your word is a light and a lamp. And we know in our lives how important light and how important lamps are. We couldn't imagine going through a day without light. We need it to live. And we need your, your word if we are to live. And so we pray that in the moments ahead, you would help us to focus on this word of life. It's not about a preacher at the front. It's not about anything like that. It's about God speaking to his people. And we pray that you would feed us, your spirit would be among us, we would hear your voice clearly, and your word, which is also sharper than a two-edged sword, would penetrate into each of our hearts and convict us and instruct us and comfort us and reassure us and challenge us as only your word can do when your spirit takes it and applies it with the force of your spirit. Your spirit knows our hearts perfectly, knows exactly of what we have need. And so we pray that in these moments, it would not simply be a human voice that will be heard, but indeed the voice of God. And what an awesome privilege that is for us to be able to say we are listening to God speaking to us may we be attentive and may we be obedient and may we be humble before your word we pray in jesus name amen if you have your bible please turn again to that passage we read from philippians chapter 4 i'm going to reread verses 10 to 13 Philippians 4 10 to 13 I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me you were indeed concerned for me but you had no opportunity not that I'm speaking of being in need for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content I know how to be brought low and I know how to be abound in any and every circumstance I have learned the secret of of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I didn't think that this person would be here today. She is, which makes it a little bit more difficult, but she's given me permission to use her as an illustration in my sermon. I'm often challenged by the life of a lady that I've known, had the privilege of knowing for, many, knowing for many years. And in all the time I have known her, she has been suffering from a debilitating illness. For years she has been in a wheelchair, almost completely paralyzed. Her health is becoming more and more complicated, yet she's still at worship twice every Lord's Day, never misses a Bible study, has been involved in church planting work when many would have said it's time for her and her husband to rest. It's no surprise that her children are in full-time Christian service. And close family members testify of how they have never heard her complain. And I have never heard her complain. And in this lady and in her husband, it's the greatest model of Christian contentment that I have ever known. Despite great difficulties, we see deep, deep contentment. And we see the same thing, don't we, when we read the magazines of the persecuted church. We see people who have lost homes, they've lost jobs, they've lost loved ones. Their churches have been burned down. And what are they doing? They're praising God. Their faces are beaming 
with joy and contentment, radiant with the love that they have for the Lord, despite everything. And how is it possible to experience such suffering over many years and yet live with joy and deep contentment? Who of us does not want to know such deep contentment? How is it possible? And at the end of his epistle to the Philippians, Paul gives the secret of such a life because this was Paul's life too. Paul gives principles for Christian contentment for every single believer. It's not for a, a super class of believer. It's for every believer. And this secret or this teaching is so badly needed because the human condition since the fall of Adam and Eve is one of discontent. Adam and Eve fell because they were discontent with God's provision. They sought their contentment outside of their relationship with God. And since then, the human condition is one of discontent in every human being. In you, and certainly in me. We continue to seek contentment outside of our relationship with God. And in these verses, Paul shows us that the only true source of contentment, he shows us where it is, and he shows us the folly of seeking contentment elsewhere. And I want us to see that this morning so that perhaps if you are struggling with contentment, you will see the secret of which Paul speaks. And if you're not struggling now, there could be a trial round the corner that will undermine the contentment that you know now and will cause it to shake to the very foundations. And will you stand? Will your Christian contentment stand in such a day? And the first thing we see, or I want you to see in this passage, is the Christian's joy in the Lord. The Christian's joy in the Lord. So Paul is in prison in Rome. He knows that he is nearing the end of his life after years of hardship and suffering in the service of Jesus Christ. He writes elsewhere of whippings, of being stoned, of shipwrecks, of sleepless nights. But by the grace of God, Paul can speak not only of his joy, but of his great joy. He received a gift from the Philippians. So is his joy because now his life will be more comfortable? He, he, he'd be able to eat better? He can afford a new blanket or a new coat? No, his joy is not related to his needs. He says that in verse 11. Not that I am speaking of being in need. His joy is deeper than that. What is it? He experiences deep joy because the gift of the Philippians has shown their love, has demonstrated their love both for him, but more importantly for Paul, for the Lord Jesus. His joy is in the Lord. He rejoices in what the Lord is doing in the lives of the Philippians. He sees their generosity despite their great poverty. He sees the sacrifices that they are making for the gospel. He sees Christ in them. And he rejoices. And this joy of Paul's is a model for each of us. The Christian. I knew it did. I nearly said Nespa. The Christian. Is it not true? It can't translate Nespa. Uh, doesn't the Christian rejoice to see evidence of God's grace in the lives of others. I was talking last night to one of the uh, a fellow pastor here and he was speaking with such joy and enthusiasm about the evidence of Christian growth in members of his congregation and, and, and seeing a hunger for the word, seeing a desire to grow, a desire for people to be at a conference like this. And that's what we do as Christians. We seek 
The Christian seeks opportunities to manifest love for Christ and for his brothers and sisters. And when we see that, we rejoice. A Christian hungers and thirsts for the word of God. And when we see that in a Christian, we rejoice. We should rejoice. When we see a Christian with a burden for his friends and relatives who don't know the Lord, we rejoice. These are reasons for great joy. And when we think of each other, yes, we're concerned for material needs of each other. We're concerned for our health needs. But is our desire, is our burden to see spiritual growth and to rejoice when we see spiritual growth? To rejoice when we see covenant children being converted and coming to know the Lord as their own saviour? That's what Paul is describing here. Despite his own suffering, he experiences great joy because he sees Christ at work in other people. And I encourage you, friends, in this week to experience that joy, to listen to each other about what the Lord is doing in each other's lives, what the Lord is doing in different parts of his kingdom, and to rejoice in that. To focus on the things of the kingdom. To rejoice in the advance of the kingdom. We pray your kingdom come. That's not just praying for the advance, a worldwide advance of the gospel. That's praying for the advance of the gospel in someone's heart. Your kingdom come in his life. Your will be done in his life, in her life. And we rejoice when we see that. Paul says, whenever I pray for you, I do it with joy. He says in chapter 2 verse 2, Make my joy complete. Our joy is based on what the Lord is doing. Do you have that same perspective as Paul? May we encourage each other this week as we share in fellowship. May we have joy in each other as we share in fellowship this week. So the Christian's joy in the Lord. Secondly, we want to note, and in two different parts, the Christian's contentment. In the Lord, the Christian's contentment in the Lord. On several occasions in this chapter, we may have been tempted to say to Paul, Are you serious? Some of you will remember John McEnroe. He used to be a really good tennis player. I used to model my serve on John, never quite as good. And I didn't quite have the same bad temper as John McEnroe unless I was playing golf. But his famous line to the umpire was, you cannot be serious. And we may be tempted to say to Paul, Paul, you cannot be serious. You tell us to rejoice always. You tell us not to worry about anything. You tell us to pray always, to give thanks in all things. And you speak about a peace that guards our hearts and thoughts. You can't be serious. I'd love to believe it. But it just doesn't seem possible. And here in verse 11, Paul goes even further. He says, Not that I'm speaking about being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. You think, that's too much. That's just too much. It's not possible. The great apostle has learned to be content whatever the situation. No grumbling. No jealousy, no resentment, no discontentment. I'll never forget when Mr. Donnelly was lecturing us in the life of Paul at the college. He and I arrived at the same time on Tuesday morning. So I had an hour's drive, sometimes in pretty miserable weather from Clock Mills. And we'd always complain about the length of our journey and about the traffic. And he was, pre- he was teaching, but preaching, about Paul's hardship. And he looked at me and said, it's tough driving an hour from Clock Mills, isn't it? <laughs> think, well, I've never forgotten that. And Paul, despite everything, the worst of situations, no grumbling, no jealousy, no resentment, no discontentment. And in a society that's based on people's discontent, we find it hard, don't we, to believe that it's possible to experience true, deep contentment. There seem to be so many things and circumstances that would eat away at our contentment. And if we're honest, we have to say we lack contentment. 
So let's take a close look at Paul's contentment. How do we explain it? And the first way we explain it is by saying that Christian contentment does not depend on circumstances. The, po- the word that Paul uses here for content is a word that speaks of independence, self-sufficiency with respect to circumstances. Paul does not depend on his circumstances to be happy. His level of contentment does not change according to his situation. We see in verse 11 that Paul found contentment in whatever state. And he describes these states in verse 12. He speaks about the highs and the lows of his life. And there were many lows. Suffering, hunger, need. On the way to Rome, he had spent two weeks without food. Two weeks. Paul was asking the question, how many times did you say, are we there yet? But if you imagine going for two weeks, how many times you'd hear, I'm hungry. He had been flogged and beaten publicly many times for his faith in Jesus Christ. And the Philippians knew what Paul was talking about. They had seen it in the life of Paul. When Paul and Silas were in prison in Philippi, what were they doing in the stocks? Were they sitting with the other prisoners moaning about their conditions, moaning about the discomfort? They were singing praises to God at midnight. What would you have been doing in that prison, in those situations? No anger, no grumbling against God and his providence. Praise joy and contentment but Paul Paul also had times of comfort and abundance after his time in prison he had spent time uh, at Lydia's and one can imagine that the the bed uh, in Lydia's was more comfortable uh, than in the prison but Paul says it doesn't matter what the circumstances are I've known both extremes my contentment doesn't depend on circumstances And what Paul is saying here reminds us of what King Solomon said to God. He says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of the Lord. If I have what I need, I'm content. There are temptations for both rich and poor. There's a danger of discontentment for those For him, everything is going well, just as much as there is for those for whom everything is going badly. If if we don't have enough, the temptation, of course, is to curse God, to say, it's not fair. Those who have little can become envious of others. They may think, it's not fair that I should suffer so much. I would be happy if if I only had this or that. Paul writes to Timothy and he says... If we have food and clothing, then that will be enough for us. Now, he doesn't say that we're forced to accept difficult circumstances if we're in a position to change them. If you have toothache, you don't say, I'm not going to the dentist. It is the will of God that I have this pain, and I must learn to be content with it. That would be a ludicrous interpretation of this teaching. Or if you lose your job, you don't say, well, too bad, I'll have to learn to be content with that. No, you go out and you look for another job. Paul does not say, don't seek to change the circumstances of your life. He's just saying, don't let your contentedness depend on the circumstances of your life. Be willing to accept God's providence. We can pray and act to change things. But we also pray, may your will be done and may I accept your will. Paul again writes to Timothy. We see that the danger is that uh, those who have much would fall into the same discontent. Paul writes to Timothy. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. And Jesus warns against the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things. 
we have riches. And this fuels the desire for more riches. And we live in a consumer society where advertising campaigns fuel discontent in your heart. You're encouraged, are you not, to pursue contentment in goods, in things, in stuff, in relationships. But these things leave a void. They leave an emptiness. Family. That's where your contentment will be found. Health, home, career, sport, your looks, your popularity. All these things are passing. All these things are passing. They will never satisfy your deepest needs. Paul doesn't say don't start a family. Don't have a comfortable house. Don't seek a good job. Don't take care of your health. He says true contentment is not found in these things. Some of you are old enough to remember what the Beatles sang in 1965. They sang a song about yesterday. And how in the blink of an eye, contentedness disappeared. Yesterday, all my troubled seems, troubles seemed so far away. I was content. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. I believe in yesterday. Why she had to go, that was the reason. Contentedness was based on a relationship, and that ended, and the contentedness was lost. And maybe I'm speaking to someone today, and your contentment is directly related to the circumstances of your life. You lack contentment. The circumstances of your life are not as you had dreamed. You're frustrated in your hope for work, for relationship. For some other thing that you yearn for, those yearnings are genuine, they're normal in many ways. Some of you young people, your contentment depends on your, your image or your relationship with someone, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and you look at others and you're, you're eaten away by jealousy or envy, you lack peace and you lack a deep-rooted contentedness do not expect to find true deep contentment in the circumstances of your life Paul says that your contentment mustn't be based on circumstances and Paul had to learn this lesson he says that twice he says I have learned and we too must learn it by nature, we lack contentment. God must teach us. Now, I remember back to the days as a, a school student and also as a teacher, the first day of term, you would get your timetable. And the first thing you'd look to see, it was interesting to observe this as a teacher, to watch the pupils doing this. They'd look and see the initials of the teacher and they'd either go, yes, or they'd go, no, not oh little. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Donnelly, I'm sure someone said that somewhere. <laughs> and seeing who our teachers were going to be made a big difference. But friends, when we learn contentedness, it's God who chooses our teachers. And often we don't go yes at those teachers. The teachers of disappointment teacher of suffering, Mr. Illness and the Miss Humiliation are the teachers that God uses to teach us contentedness in his school. And these teachers are hard on us, but the lessons we learn at their feet are so important. Do not seek your contentment in the things of this world. There's a very moving hymn written by an American businessman evangelist in 1871. Following the death of his four daughters, he'd already lost a son. His business had collapsed in the great fire of Chicago. And he was on his way to England for a, a, an evangelistic campaign. He sent his wife and his four daughters on ahead in the ship called La Ville du Havre. 
And that ship was sunk, and the four daughters perished. And the wife sent a telegram to him, two words. I think it was alone survived, something like that. She alone survived. And he took the next boat to cross the Atlantic. And while he was crossing the Atlantic, he wrote these words. Whatever my lot, you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. You have taught me to say, it is well with my soul. We are not naturally contented. The second thing we learn about this contentment, it's not rooted in our circumstances, it is rooted in the Lord. We read in verses 11 and 12, when we read those verses, we're tempted to say, how is it possible? And Paul speaks of the secret of being content. We say, well, Paul, tell us this secret. With all these terrible situations that you have known, with your current situation, tell us the secret. We need to know. And Paul tells us in verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And we need to take a moment to realize what that verse doesn't say. Because when I was younger, I had a, a, a Fijian rugby shirt. And across the middle of the Fijian rugby shirt were the words Philippians 4.13. <laughs> well, England could wear that all over their rugby shirt and they'll still not beat Ireland. <laughs> could say Croatia could wear that on their football shirts and they'll still not beat France. Who knows? Pride comes before a fall. But it doesn't mean that we can do absolutely anything. And this verse is often misapplied even in Christian circles. If I want to be rich, if I want to be a millionaire, if I want to get the job of my dreams, if I want to be successful, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, through him who strengthens me. That's not what Paul is saying. He's not saying Jesus will enable you to do whatever you set your heart on. Name it and claim it. Paul is speaking here in the context of Christian contentment in both easy and difficult situations. He's speaking about contentment despite circumstances. And so he's confirming that contentment is possible. Not thanks to circumstances, but thanks to one who strengthens. Christian contentment, says Paul, does not come from within himself. It doesn't come from his circumstance. It comes from one who strengthens you. And the Christian can experience this, this contentment, both in abundance and in need, thanks to the spiritual strength that Christ alone bestows. For all the trials which God calls the Christian to pass through, he does not promise to anaesthetize you against suffering, pain and sickness. You, know, you don't need me to tell you that. What God promise, promises is to give the Christian the necessary strength for that trial. To enable him to know contentment. We know that Paul had prayed several times that God would deliver him from a thorn in the flesh. But instead of delivering him, God reminds him graciously of his sufficient grace. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul goes on, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. I'm content with all those things by the power of Christ. But friends, we must, we must emphasize the key phrase in this verse. It's easy to emphasize, I can do all things, I can do all things. But the key phrase comes at the end. Through him or in him, who strengthens me. Paul's confidence for his contentment is in the one who strengthens him. That is to say, in Jesus Christ. 
Paul is able to experience contentment because Paul is in Christ Jesus. He is united to Christ by faith and that changes everything. Here is the secret. Paul values Christ as his supreme treasure and so he has learned not to seek his treasure elsewhere, not to overvalue things that don't last. He does not seek to know wealth and comfort. He only wants to know his Saviour and Lord. Paul knows that his eternal contentment will be found in Christ Jesus. So why seek contentment elsewhere now? And even death for Paul cannot, cannot prevent his contentment because he says that Christ will be glorified in my body with full assurance, either by life or by death. He knows that death will be a gain to him because he will have more of Christ, more contentment. He will lose all his material things, but he will gain Christ. And if you're a Christian, at the moment God calls you home, you will gain Christ. You will be in his presence. Why do you feel you're missing out on things here? With that heavenly perspective, why? Why would you be upset about missing out on things here? Paul is content because he has Christ. And so if you're a Christian and you lack contentment this morning, remember that you have Jesus Christ, what more do you want? What more could you have? In Christ, all your sin is forgiven. In Christ, you have been saved from the hell you deserve. In him, you have full assurance of eternal life. Very often, our contentment leaves us when we, when we feel insecure. You have full assurance of eternal life. You have been adopted into the family of God. In Christ, all the riches of Christ are yours. They're all yours. All these things are true. Are true. So why are you discontent? You will spend eternity in the presence of Christ. And as I said earlier, yet you're, you're discontent because your neighbours have a better house. You've been clothed with the perfect righteousness of Christ and you're unhappy because your friends have better clothes it doesn't make sense you see Paul's great desire in life was to have deeper fellowship with Christ there he wasn't content he longed for deeper fellowship he longed to know Christ better he longed that Christ would be known by others he lived for the glory of Christ and his contentment was linked to Christ in every way Paul's thrown into prison. He's content because Christ is preached. Some in the church in Rome preach Christ in order to hurt Paul. Paul's content. Christ is preached. They want to make him suffer. Paul is content. Christ is preached. And Paul is willing to submit to the sovereign will of Christ for his life. He trusts his Lord to do what is right. He trusts him to do what is for his glory and for Paul's good. He knows he's being held in the hands of his loving Saviour. And that's what strengthens him. Does that strengthen you this morning? Knowing that you're being held in the loving hands of your Saviour. It's not your strength that holds you. It's Christ's strength. This is what enables him to say, I can be content whatever the circumstances of my life. Christ makes it possible. Yes, there are tears. Do you think the hymn writer didn't shed tears for his children? Yes, there is pain. Yes, I have questions. But I look to the cross of Jesus Christ and I see his pain and I see his suffering and I see his love and those things strengthen me and those things bring me contentment. 
I am content because Jesus Christ is with me. He is with me by his spirit, by his word, by his promises, by the close communion I have with him. All those things strengthen me. Christ is my supreme treasure. I am content. This morning, friends, do you have that contentment? Do you have this peace? Look into your heart. Do you know this contentment is only to be found in one person, in one place? It was the cross of Jesus Christ. Come afresh and contemplate your Savior on the cross. He's there for you. He's there to settle the debt of your sin. He's there to take the punishment that sets you free. He's there that you might know him, that you might know Christ and find deep, deep contentment in Christ. In Christ you have everything you need. Come to him. Seek your happiness your joy, your contentment in him alone. I want to speak to the young people. Are you seeking Christ in your life above everything else? You're, long, you're young and your lives are ahead of you. And in schools, I know you've got career planning and all this here. It's all very important. You get careers advice. Well, here's more advice and there's better advice. Above everything else, seek Jesus Christ. Pursue Jesus Christ above anything else. And your friends are pursuing other things. And your friends are telling you, this is the path to happiness. This is the way you'll be content. Don't believe it. They're too afraid to tell you how miserable they are. They're too afraid to tell you that their lives are empty. But you seek Jesus Christ with all your heart, and with all your strength. You don't need what the world has to offer to be content. You need Christ as your Lord and Savior. You won't find it in stuff. You won't find it in looks. You won't find it in the perfect body. You won't find it in popularity. You need Christ. If you make contentment your goal, you'll never get it. If you make Christ your goal, you'll get Christ and far more. Psalm 73, which we're about to sing, says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. I go back to my former pastor, Mr. Donnelly, who talked about 20-year-old idealists becoming 30-year-old materialists. Maybe some of you, 10 or 20 years ago, you'd have turned the world upside down for Christ. But you've lost that. You've lost that fire. You've lost that burden. You've lost that contentment. Would you come back to Christ and find your contentment in Christ? Can you say, there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you? May each one of us be able to say that with an honest heart this morning. Amen. Let us pray. Father, whom have we in the heavens but you? And on earth, who do we desire but you alone? Forgive us for when we have spent our lives chasing after the things of this world. Forgive us. We're ashamed. We're ashamed to say that we have put earthly things above the things of the kingdom. We have sought earthly things above the kingdom and we have not found satisfaction in them we have not found contentment 
And so we pray that this morning, once again, we would find true contentment in Christ and in Christ alone. Pray for the young people here. So much pressure on them to seek happiness and contentment elsewhere. Keep them, Lord, from going down wasteful, wasteful paths that lead to destruction and lead to ruin. But set them on the path that leads to Christ and a life of worth, of glory in serving Christ. Father, apply your word to our hearts. We need this contentment. May we shine as lights of contentment in a world of discontent. May people see Christ in us as we glory in him, as we find our contentment in him. So we pray that in this week and in the weeks and months and years ahead, we could say there is no one I desire, nothing I desire, except Christ and to know him and to know him better. We pray this in his worthy name. Amen.